Our friend Rick Barnes, man, we have been waiting a long time, Coach, to have you on. So I, I'm going to have to just pass the relay baton off to Chris Burke, who a Tennessee grab, because he's he going to talk a little baseball with you to start with. I know that. Yeah, Coach, uh, awesome having you on. Um, I know you're a big baseball guy, and I know you're very close to uh, Tony Vitello and his program. Our podcast, Coach Me Up, I would just love to hear, number one, uh, kind of big brother, maybe little brother relationship. So I've heard a, a little bit with you two guys. Like, how are you coaching him up early in his career as he's building this this uh, behemoth of a program? And maybe how it's flipped, maybe some things you've learned from him along the way as well. You, you know, Chris, what I would say, um, and I'm not saying this in a condescending way, but when I look at Tony, I can almost look back and see me 35 mm -hmm. years ago. When, when I became a head coach that I wanted to stand up, fight for our program. And, you know, he came in to a program that uh, had had some success, but uh, he's taken it to a level so quickly. And, and I like the, the feistiness that he has instilled. And, and um, it's almost like, you know, he's, he hasn't been afraid to take on City Hall, mm. basically. You know, <laughs> he's come in and said, hey, we, we belong here. You know, we're a part of this league. And you know, we're not on a, a timetable here. And, and so just watching him, honestly, at uh, that point in time in my career really motivated me even more so, you mm -hmm. know, because I watched his fire. And, and, I, and I think as long as you're in this game, you've got to continue to have that fire. And, and, uh, and being around Tony, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I, I think he's going to be around the game a long time. I think he's going to have a platform. And he already has, you know, he uh, – I, I've has I have a golf uh, – tournament that we've ran here for Emerald Youth for a long time and and what I'd encourage Tony to do was to get out and really be a part of the community because people care here mm. they, they really care and uh, he, he's done that you know he's been able to get out and you know obviously people want to see him they want to they want to touch him they want they want him to be a part of this community and he's done a great job with that and uh, I think that's only going to grow and uh, as he continues I mean he's certainly has an unbelievable career ahead of him, but um, he's already made a great impact on this university and this, and this city. Rick, I was telling the guys before you jumped on with us that on the wall of your film room, which I've been blessed to be in there with you and your team watching film, and I, I learn every time I'm in there, but there's four letters, I-N-A-M, that are on that wall. Tell us what those letters mean, how you came about it, and, and what it means to your program, please. Well, one of my one of my last years at, at Texas, you know, we we had a group of guys. We had uh, had a lot of guys that had left early for the NBA, and we were always concerned about con trying to maintain the culture we had built there. And I had a, a, a Navy SEAL come in, and and uh, he said, "You guys need to come up with a motto that you want to live by, what you want to do." And and actually, John, Jonathan Holmes was one of the guys that said, uh, "It should be. It's not about me." And he came up, and that's what it's about. It's not about me. And I think that when you go to that from a biblical standpoint, I mean, you know, the Bible is full of stories where we should put other people first, you know, love our neighbors, you know, the way we love ourselves. And and so we really tried to live that, that we want to be servant-minded and, and uh, think about other people. And, you know, we can all just not make it about us and make it about uh, our team and the people around us. And, and when I talk about our team, I'm not just talking the guys on the team. I'm talking about our, our managers, our staff, mm. uh, people that we meet over in, in uh, Smokies when we go to eat over there, the bus drivers. I mean, it would. I, I do know this. I have a group of players on our team. If they ever saw a younger player not treat someone with respect around our program, they would call them out. Mm. And uh, whether it's the people that take care of our facility, you know, we we know them by name, mm. and uh, they're important. You know, they're, they're they're just as important as anybody here. And so when we talk about it, it's not about me. It's again, it's not just what we do on the basketball court. It's about the way we want to live our life. So, so coach, I know I know we got a bunch of coaches that and and parents, right, that listen to our podcast. And when you talk about building that culture, obviously, as a college basketball coach, you've been at it a long time. You've probably stubbed your toe trying to implement that here or there. But you also get the the fortune. I mean, it's not that it's easy, but you get to recruit and maybe establish you know, what guys would buy into that, what guys wouldn't. If you were a, high, let's say you're a high school basketball coach right now, or high school, any any sport coach, and you're sitting there going, okay, well, I don't necessarily get to pick and choose my players. What's a practical, tangible exercise maybe that that these coaches, men and women, can use with their team to try to build that? It's not about me mindset with their players. Well, again, I, whether I get to choose or pick my players, uh, 
you know, I think you have a, 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 a whatever world that you live in or wherever God has placed you, you have a way that you can make an impact. And what do you, what do you want that impact to be? What do you want people to best know mm-hmm. about you? You said it. I, I'd stub my toes many, many times when I was younger because, it, you know what, I made it about me. It was about me. I didn't want my players, when, when we didn't play well, you know, I took my frustration out on them as opposed to maybe looking at myself and saying, you know, I could have prepared them better. I could have done this better. And then I also realized that maybe I got tunnel vision from that where I didn't see the whole picture the way I needed to see it. So if, if I were, and I will tell you this, uh, some of my, what I would call, uh, I've been asked many times, you know, who are some of the people that you've met that have really influenced your life? And I have been blessed. The good Lord has put so many people in my life, but the people that really that really shaped me were my eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh grade coaches mm-hmm. and teachers, hmm. because you know what they they were, and I and I tell people all the time that it, it, it's an, uh, a really a blessing and a calling to to want to work with high school, junior high school kids. It's a blessing, and and what I loved about them, I could tell you a, a story. I mean, I, I I lost my sister in a car accident. Uh, I, I fell the first grade, supposed to be going into the ninth grade. I was going into the eighth grade, and my sister really raised, uh, had, a, had a lot to do with my little brother, and I came from a family of five, and when she got killed, I went just crazy. I mean, I had made up my mind I was going to quit school, and that was the only thing we were ever asked to do, to go to high school, get a job. And at that point in time, and I look back on it, God brought into my life some incredible teachers and hmm. coaches, and I had an eighth-grade coach by the name of Alan Bean, and uh I was a rebel. I mean, I really would do anything to get out of trouble. But I was, and I was the best player on the team. He didn't let me play because I had a really bad, nasty attitude in terms of, you know what? I made it about me, mm-hmm. and uh, we ended up. Uh, and I was going to quit in the eighth grade. And my ninth grade coach said to me, Bill Johnson, if you quit now, don't even bother coming out for your eighth grade for the ninth grade team next year because you quit now, you're going to find it easier to quit later on in life. And so he wouldn't let me quit, and he told me I, he was the one that told me I was a jerk, feeling sorry for myself. And he said other people have lost loved ones too, and you're just you know you're you're just uh, out of control. Really, and I was, I really was. And uh, and so I, uh, he told me I want you to start doing this, 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 and practice. Be there early, do all this, and that went on for about three weeks. And uh, I still wasn't playing any. And the last two weeks of the regular season, uh, my uh, coach Alan Bean let me play, and I ended up scoring, you know, averaging like 23 points over the last two games. But I remember when I got back after our last game, he mm-hmm. said to me, he said, Rick Barnes, we would have won the seventh and eighth grade championship if I would have let you play, but I think by letting you play, I would have ruined your mm-hmm. life. And he said, wow. if giving up a championship, if giving up a championship teaches you a lesson, it's well worth yep. it. The following year, that group of guys, we did win the ninth grade championship. And I think about coaches at that age, and I have just great respect for them, but I think the most important thing is that you always try to see the big picture, and you've got to look at even my team now. I look at each guy as an individual guy, but how can I best help them? And when I made it about me, I didn't see anything but me in it, and that doesn't work. Rick, you were so generous. I don't know what it was. You and I were at the Final Four together maybe four years ago, uh, and I was presenting an award to you. And you shared your story that I, I, I hope you'll share with us again. Your daughter, when you were at the University of Texas, came in one Sunday morning and had a hard conversation with you. And you said, God grabbed a hold of your heart and changed you. Tell us about that conversation and the effect that it had on you, please. Well, Jimmy, what I would tell you first, I grew up uh, in a home that we went to church Wednesday night, Sunday, Sunday night, um, revival come through. I mean, I went to church. I mean, I, <laughs> I was with my grandparents uh almost like whether or not I mean we were in church and okay. uh, so I, I knew about I knew about uh, you know what I knew about God uh, I think throughout my entire life but I don't think I knew God yeah I don't think I knew the relationship what or what it really meant I, but I certainly knew about I'd heard many Baptist sermons about hell fire and damnation and back then I heard more uh, probably more sermons on hell than I did on on grace and uh, okay. and so, uh, you know, once I got going into college coaching, and, and, and I, again, I would not be where I am today without my wife, Candy. I mean, she is, the, the, you know, the 
she talked about, I mean, she's incredible. And again, I wouldn't be where I am today without her. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Uh, I got into coaching, became a, a head coach early, and um, started thinking that I was all that. And, uh, you know, uh, just wandered away from my, my core of what I knew, what was right and wrong. And, and uh, I was living uh, in the flesh, as Paul would say. I was living in the flesh and everything, whether it was fame, fortune, uh, you name it, uh, I, I, that would that would be me. I, I, I think that I would say that I lived a little bit like David lived in terms of you know, or Saul. You know, you know Saul was never ninety a hundred percent in with the Lord. He was about ninety percent in, and you can't be ninety percent in anything. And mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and my I, I'd stopped going to church with my family as back when biking was big in Texas, and I was going out acting like I was going to spend time, you know, uh, in my own little world like that, and. She had, she sat me down and she simply said to me and, and I love my daughter and with uh, and my wife and family more than you can ever imagine but she said to me one day first of all they told me they didn't like the uh, father that I was being the husband I was being to my wife they thought I was mm -hmm. too short tempered and and then uh, she said to me she said you know Dad uh, Mom Nick and I love Jesus Christ and we're we're going to be in heaven one day and she said I'm going to tell you. The way you're living your life right now, you're never going to make it. You're not going. You're not going to be there, and that's that breaks my heart. And uh, I remember getting my car driving, and and, and uh, obviously when she said that to me, I got defensive and said, you know, who you know who are you to tell me this that? But I knew every word that she spoke to me that day, and my son was there too, Nick. They spoke to me. I I knew it was the truth because mm -hmm. because it, I had made it about me again. It was all about yep. me, me, what I wanted to do, and. And, uh, and and that, I think it's a great thing to know that, that I, I did. I remember, you know, growing up in, in western North Carolina, Billy Graham, back when I was growing up, was a very influence around the world. And I remember being on my, I, again, I got baptized at East Hickory Baptist Church, and then I, but I also remember kneeling down in front of the TV one night when I was in the eighth grade when he made the comment, you can do it right there at home, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and truly... I went through a time where I know that I was in, in uh, that where, where Christ had come into my life. But like I think a lot of people today, and I think it's happening now, there's a lot of people are wandering from that. Yeah. And what, I, what I've learned to do is that uh, once Christ does come in, He's not going to let you go. And, and just like I think that uh, where whether, you, whether you talk about David or whether you talk about Paul, you talk about any of those uh, people in the Bible, there's so many stories in the Bible about people that live like, I've lived, yeah. you know, that have fallen short. But we have a we have a God, we have a Savior that said, hey, you know, I, I've taken care of your sins for you. Yep. And and so with that said, it goes back, well, once you, he's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. And I realized that that day that, you know what, I was running from him uh, all because of being selfish and self-centered. And, uh, and, and you know what it really got down to uh, is the fact that, I wasn't spending time with him. I got caught up in the world. My, all my time was I was too busy to read the Bible. I was too busy to, you know, to really go to a church on Sunday to worship him and to thank him. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mean, thank, thank in him for how much he loves us, you know. And uh, certainly I, I want to love him with my, all my heart, but I can't even imagine why he did what he did for us yeah. on the cross. But but the fact is I, 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 I didn't... Um, I didn't know him anymore. I knew about him, but you know, it's like in high school. You know, you get to know people in high school, and then you leave them in high school. Mm -hmm. You don't know them anymore, mm -hmm. no. and, and and years go by. But then there's some people that you meet, you could not see them for thirty years, but you know them. Mm. Well, I got where I, again. I still knew about him, but I didn't know him the way I needed to know him. And I and I and I really believe this today. If I don't get up every day and feed my soul with His Word, that this world will eat you mm. alive. It yeah. will eat you up, and uh, so that's. Uh, that was a, it was a, uh, yeah. and I, would, I tell people, young kids, when I tell, to talk to them, don't be afraid to tell your parents the truth because mm. you've got to have truth tellers yeah. in your life. And the fact is, I'm, I'm grateful that my, my wife really has the credit for teaching our children to stand up for, and be bold for what they believe. So, so Coach, it sounds like you were uh, admonished slash coached by your daughter, and you took that coaching. Mm -hmm. And you reflected upon it, right? And then acted upon it. Something tells me we're going to have some some people that are listening right now that are listening to the sound of your voice and are probably being convicted themselves. Like, 
it's one thing to be convicted, but then it has to be followed with action. You talked about getting back into the word. Was there a, was that an, like after that, was it an instant turnaround for you? Did you completely go a different direction or was it a kind of a slow build up towards building those faith relationships back? Well, we, we were going to a church and, and I will tell you another story when I, uh, Matt Carter, who's, who just stepped down from a pastorate in Houston, he, he came to Austin with a bunch of, uh, he went to Texas A&M and Matt Carter started a church at, uh, called the Austin Stone, and it really, at a time where I, it was the place to be, and my daughter and my son went there, and, and it was so different. I grew up in a Baptist church where it was, you know, a Baptist church. Oh, yeah. I, they asked me to go to this uh, service with them. Uh, I sat on the very back row because it was like a rock concert. You know, the, that's not, I mean, I grew up, and I still, I mean, I, I, I certainly have branched out now where I like all different kind of Christian music, but at the time, I'm... You know, Hymns. how great thou art, yeah, you know, sure. great is thy yeah. faithfulness, yep. the old rugged cross. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I will tell you, Matt Carter said to me something one day when, because, uh, you know, we were having some issues in our marriage, and uh, he said to me, and it and it's so true, he said, you know, Coach, he said, if you die today, he said, there's a lot of people that's going to stand up and say some great things about you and say that, you know, you've done this, you've done that, you know, this, whatever. He said, but you know what's going to be the sad part? Your family's going to be sitting right there on the front row of the pew, and they're going to be saying, "You know what? You guys really don't know him." Mm. Mm. Wow. I mean, and and that's tr- and I think that's true in a lot of families. I think it's true in a lot of people that there's a persona out there. And so, what I'm saying is, my professional persona didn't reflect who I really was as a person, because oh. you know we all know that when we're alone with ourselves, that we're, where our real character is revealed and who we are. And so, but to answer your, your question, Chris, uh, I think that it was a process where, uh, again, where God had not left me, and you know, he, he he started, you know, doing it on his time. It's like you know, in you know John three when he's talking to you know Nicodemus about the wind blows where it blows, and you never know where it's coming from, but you know it's there. I kind of felt like that, like that's how God is. He's blown through me at different times to uh, put me in different places and. I always thought that I would be at Texas, but I found out that he had a bigger plan for me to come to Tennessee, and uh, and I and I do believe that. I, I do know that he's in, in control of all of our lives, whether we want it to be or not. He is. He'll give us some lead way, and, yep. and we can make some mistakes, but in the end, he he's got a plan for us to learn through that. And uh, but uh, the fact is, it's an it's an everyday re- relationship. It's not you know I don't I don't. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm, I know the devil is alive and well, and if I mm-hmm. give him a chance, he's going to try to take me down. Rick, our, our podcast is called Coach Me Up, and I know our listeners right now, are they're like probably Chris and I. You see his coach, we're, we're, we're taking notes as you talk. It's not that we're not paying attention. We're literally writing stuff down, being coached up by one of the truly great coaches in all of sports right now. And there's been a lot of talk about – whose culture is better. Who's, I just know Tennessee's culture is as real and as authentic and as good as there is out there. And it, it, because of the leadership that you, that you are, you, you displayed your leadership. Your talk was backed up by your walk for about, I, I might be wrong, nine or 10 month period. Every single day you sent a text message to Dick Vitale, coach, when he was going through his battle with cancer sending him a prayer, asking for healing in his life, which ultimately came through. Why did you do that? I, I've told people before, hey, I'll be praying for you, and I didn't follow through. You did it every single day for 10 months. Why? Coach me you up know, on that. You know, Jimmy, uh, when I finally had, uh, you know, it came out what Dick was going through, and, and a friend of mine, Tommy Abadamarco, had encouraged me to call Dick, and I, and I wasn't sure. Uh, I knew he'd be hit by a lot of people, and so I really – sent him a text and just said, hey, I, I know you're going through a lot. I wanted to reach out, but I'm sure you're busy, which is probably not maybe a good thing to say. But I said, I just, it was, it was a long text. And I said, but, and uh, I prayed with him during that text and he wrote me back and, and uh, with a really a heartfelt text and told me how much it meant to him. And he said, I really do want you to pray for me every day. But what I realized when I was sending him that first text is what it did for me. Hmm. You know, what it did for me to truly have someone here and that I could uh, pray for and and uh, and so not only it, it, it was it something that I looked forward to doing every day was to really sit down and 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 not only pray it but 
the text it in a way that it would be real, authentic, and. Uh, but it was, uh, and Dick actually texted me back and said to me, he said, he said, Rick, you don't have to do this every day. I said, no, I really want to. The Bible tells us to. The Bible yeah. tells us to, to pray and, 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 and with people. And it was someone that, um, that when he, honestly, when he, when he truly, and, and, you know, some people will say, pray for me. When he said it, uh, he meant it, you know, was where he was going through. And, and, and what I've learned is when, like you say, when some people say, will you pray for me? I think it's best right then and there um, to pray right there because, as yeah. you said, sometimes we forget it. But when someone says, hey, I need your prayers daily, and, and uh, you know, I, I believe me, I know I have people that pray for me daily, and I certainly know, know that I need it. But uh, it was uh, just as time went on, it was, like I said, not only was it uh, do I, I, I like to think that God had his hand all over it, but it was not only for Dick, it was for me too. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 11:25 He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed and I am certain I know for me when somebody sends me a, a text letting letting me know that they're praying for me uh, how much that refreshes refreshes me encourages me mm -hmm. and like you said and I think it's beautiful uh how much it your soul was was filled up and refreshed by knowing that somebody else was being refreshed by your uh obedience and lo and just really love and care for them it's a great practical mm -hmm. example of that that scripture coming to life so appreciate you sharing that with us mm -hmm. rick i know you're in the preparation for the season so i, don't, I just want to keep you for about two or three more minutes but if you would please coach us up on a story from the bible or a scripture that that really just impacts you right now or even from your past either one just coach us up on something you know, Jamie, what I would tell you is, like, right now, I have people that I really, uh, that mentor me, uh, and we have, we do, Candy and I support ministries that we really believe in, that we think are reaching the world, and so I, I go, I listen to a, uh, a lot of people, but really, some people that really impact my lives, and like, I'm going through a series with, about David, the life of David right now, Okay. and uh, by and it's coming through Sam, the, you know, the book of Samuel, and I and I look at what David did and and the way he lived his life, and certainly you know people that know that story about about him, but but the best part about that is how you know he was after God's own heart, and and that's that's what he's you know that's what he's he's known for a man after God's own heart, and so when I look back at all of my my sin and my shortcomings and. And I do know that the most important thing in life is our relationship with God. It's more important than my family. Anything I can do is is knowing God in that way. Then I think I think of, of Paul. Uh, you know, I, I love biblical figures because it, the, I think the Bible is full of people like us who yeah. have fallen short. I mean, whether you talk about James and John, who basically said to Jesus, when we get to heaven, can, hey, can we sit on your right and your left? <laughs> being selfish, you right. know, being like, hey, making it about me. When, when you think about Peter, who was a hothead, you know, who just kind yep. of, you know, went on, you know, and did his thing. So I think that when you when you look at different Bibles, when you, when, when you look at uh, someone like Daniel, the book of Daniel, where he stayed, you know, Pat, you know, regardless, you know, he was willing to give it all up. And so I think the Bible is just full of human stories about people and we really read it and and i know how much uh i've fallen short but but i like i heard a, a great story last night about stephen about where you think about when you know when jesus went to heaven he said he'd be standing at the he'd be seated at the right hand of, of god the father well think about stephen when he when he's there and they're getting ready to stone him because he absolutely refused to you know, to go back on his belief. And back then when they were stoning people, they weren't throwing little pebbles now. I mean, they were throwing yeah, right. stones, and it was so bad that if a stone was in the way for the next one to come, they would move that stone. But then right there in Stephen, think about the way he went out. He said, God, forgive them, for they mm. don't. And the same thing that Jesus said on the cross. But the best part about that scripture was when you look at it, Stephen said that he saw the throne of God, and Jesus was standing up. And so think about it. Whatever Stephen was doing was enough to make Jesus stand up and applaud him. And I think mm, we should wow. all live a life where we want to think that can we do something to get Jesus to stand up and applaud us. <laughs> and uh, so think about what what Stephen, I mean, I'm sure at that point in time when he was being you know, stoned to death. But then I also think right there at that same story, 
Paul's holding his garment. And little did know Paul that when he heads down the road to Damascus that his life's getting ready to be changed. And so yeah. with that said, I, I think when you look through the Bible and we, we all, uh, the guilt that we carry with us and uh, that we, but if we really truly love Jesus Christ, knowing that he took everything to the cross and for him to love us like that is really mind boggling. But, but I like to think that uh, when you get into the Word that you can see things where like Stephen saw God standing up and I think God was applauding him like, you know, well done. Mm. And I think that we all should live a life that, hey, what can we do to glorify God and Him truly that He wants to say, hey, stand up and applaud us for the way we live. And uh, if we go with that thought every day, uh, good things are going to happen. Coach, thank you. I mean, we've you were that high high on our list ever since we started our Coach Me Up podcast. You and I have talked about this podcast for a mm -hmm. couple of years, and I, I I appreciate you being a mentor to me. I appreciate you challenging me. I appreciate you giving an example to me uh, as a dad and as a believer of what a follower of the way should look like. Because that that's that's who you are to me. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that. Yeah, thanks, well, thank Coach. You. I really love you appreciate guys. Your time. And... I appreciate you guys and keep doing what you're doing. All right. Yes, All right. Sir. God bless you. Yes, All right. sir. Thank you.